hello to uh, to everybody and uh, we had uh, in the late uh, in the latest uh, seminar uh, Mohammad uh, Farhat uh, talk about the the earth moon evolution the the receding of the moon from the earth uh, after the, the big impact and uh, and this time we are really looking to the very early stage of this uh, of this event and we have the pleasure to have uh, june korenaga who is from uh, professor at yale university and uh, june is really a specialist of the adean part adean moment of the of the of the earth so the very early stage of the earth the uh, the formation continent of the continental crust and also about the very early stage of the lunar formation so i'm very pleased that he he agreed to give this lecture and uh, he will tell us everything about where the moon was and the formation of the moon uh, just uh, at the beginning so june you can uh, now share your screen and we are very eager to listen to you okay uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction uh today uh I, I like to talk about my recent work on the early hydro evolution of the earth moon system which is actually not published yet so you are getting a kind of a sneak review of uh, what will be published eventually hopefully um, so I, I like to start with some real basics. I, I guess you have seen this probably uh, quite a few times by now, but just to be self-contained. Uh, this is a present day Earth moon system viewed from Mars and they are separated by uh, this distance. Uh, do you see castle in my presentation? You see, okay, great. Uh, this distance, which is about 60 Earth radii. And as you know, the moon is slowly receding from Earth with the rate of about 3.8 centimeter per year. And at the same time, to preserve the system's angular momentum, Earth's length of the day decreases by uh, two milliseconds per century. This lunar recession takes place, of course, by tidal interaction between Earth and the moon. Because of lunar gravity, Earth deforms like this, and this deformation is called the tidal bulge. And if Earth is purely elastic, this tidal bulge always points to the moon, but the actual Earth is not purely elastic, it's more like a viscoelastic. So it takes some time to adjust itself to lunar gravity. And because Earth is rotating faster than moon's orbital motion, this delay in tidal response results in a torque applied by the moon in a sense to slow down Earth's rotation. And at the same time, the moon moves away from Earth. And this means that if you go backward in time, the moon was closer and Earth was spinning faster. And uh, many people have tried to reconstruct the tidal evolution of the Earth's moon system. And this is uh, this one is an example, one example from the classic work of Webb. And you can see, uh, depending on how you model tidal dispersion, you get different answers. If you do a simple treatment like frequency independent dispersion or talk, you, uh, you get these curves A and B, which are highly unrealistic. And with frequency dependence, you get this curve C if you consider only dispersion within the surface ocean, or this curve D if you consider dispersion in both the ocean and the solid earth. With this curve D, um, uh, the Earth's moon distance becomes zero before reaching to the beginning of the Archean, which is uh, 4 billion years ago. But my impression is that uh, people working on tides are not really concerned with deep time, probably not now anymore, but it was probably the case in the past. And to prove my point, uh, this model D, okay, this guy, uh, has long been treated as the best available model because it does a good job explaining um, uh, explaining available geological constraints on past lunar distance from tidal deposits as uh, shown here as circles. But understanding the early Earth situation is still important for a few different reasons. First reason, I think uh, uh, Mohammed also talked about this last time, is a lunar inclination problem. 
this is a present day orbital configuration of Earth's moon system. And the lunar orbit has an inclination of about five degrees uh, from the ecliptic. And according to theoretical calculations, it could be as large as 10 degrees or more in the past. It turns out it's not so easy to explain how the moon has acquired this inclination. This is because a moon forming giant, giant impact, which is a leading hypothesis for the origin of the moon, leads to uh, zero lunar inclination. A protolunar disk, disk after the giant impact is spread on the ecliptic plane. So if you make a moon out of it, it should stay on the ecliptic plane. And this is a major dynamical difficulty associated with the giant impact hypothesis known as the lunar inclination problem. And uh, there are multiple mechanisms proposed to explain the origin of the lunar inclination, as, as you can see here. And uh, so you can explain uh, by, uh, you know, you can create the inclination very early, like uh, soon after uh, the giant impact, where you can make it, you can gain the inclination gradually for the first 10, for 100 million years when uh, moon is migrating out from the earth or uh, by something uh, very different. But important po point here is that the, these mechanisms all depend on the early evolution of lunar distance in the, in the first uh, 10 to 100 million years after the moon forming giant impact. The second reason is that uh, its impact on thermal evolution of the early Earth and the early moon. When the moon was close to the Earth, tidal dissipation should be significant both within Earth and within the moon. And according to Kevin Zandi and Norm Sweep, tidal heating, uh, which is shown here in green, uh, was the most important heat source during the Earth's first 100 million years. Okay. And the similar thing can be said about the moon. And it turns out the early thermal evolution of the moon is still quite controversial. And the people are still debating how long the lunar magma ocean lasted. This is a compilation of uh, uh, things related to early lunar chronology. And this middle row shows the two contrasting models for the lifetime of lunar magma ocean, 10 million years here to 200 million years. And this uncertainty affects the early lunar crater chronology. And because lunar crater chronology is a main observational constraint on the intensity of late accretion, this debate on the lunar magma ocean falls back to the early Earth evolution. So early evolution of the lunar distance touches on quite a few different issues. So how to constrain the early tidal evolution? We have two ways. One is backward in time starting from the present day, as in this example. And this is what most people do. And that's understandable because we know the present day situation best, and it seems the most secure way of solving this problem. Uh, so these are one, two, one, two, yeah, five, a uh, uh, few uh, representative example of this backward in time approach. And this one is by Webb, 1982 is the same as what I have already shown in the previous slides. And this one is by Ave and others in 2001. It's interesting because as far as I know, this is the only one that considers the influence of evolving continental configurations. And in the last couple of years, we have seen the publication of more sophisticated models, Tyler uh, 2021, uh, Daher et al. 2021, and uh, Fark, uh, Fahad, et al. 2022, uh, which Mohammed talked about last month. Also, also shown uh, uh, geological estimates for from tidal deposits and one from bonded iron formation. And this uh, all this tidal deposit estimate at 1.4 GA was published in 2018. So Webb and Ave and others were of course not aware of this constraint. So it's a kind of remarkable that Webb's model uh, is still compatible with this latest constraint. This banded ion information based estimate has been around since the late 1980s, but it remains very controversial. So it's a little bit surprising to see that this uh, data point was taken seriously by Tyler 
2021. But the point here is that uh, when it comes to tidal evolution in the Hadean or the Ariakian, the existing models uh, start to diverge quite substantially. And if we, if we start to think about more deeply about ocean tides, we soon realize that it's a very challenging problem. The prime difficulty is best illustrated by this work by Motoyama and others published in 2020, in which they show that the ocean tides are quite sensitive to the topography of ocean basins. And this is the modeling of lunar distance as a function of time. And these are uh, uh, tidal Q and normalized torque as a function of model distance. And those curves with different colors corresponds to different coefficients of internal tide, which depend on sea floor topography. And as you can see, uh, even with the same average ocean depth, uh, which is assumed to be 2.6 kilometer in this particular example, you can have a range of tidal response uh, for different sea floor topography. And this also implies that different configurations of continents give you similar variations. So if you want to predict ocean tides in the early Earth, you need to have a really good understanding of early Earth landscape or hypsometry. Now, uh, the problem of early Earth landscape is something I've been working for years by now. And roughly speaking, there are three important issues. The temple plate tectonics in the past, growth of continental crust, and the history of ocean volume. They have been important developments in all of these topics in the last decade or so, but I don't think they are widely appreciated yet. So I like to spend some time on what we have learned about continental growth and uh, past, ocean, or past ocean volume. Because ocean tides play uh, such a dominant role in the early tidal evolution, it's really important to understand how much we already know about the early Earth landscape and how much we still don't. Now, um, if you have ever read the paper about continental growth, you may have seen a figure like this, which, which you see many models have been proposed for continental growth, and they all look very different to each other. Uh, this was a situation when I started to work on continental growth a few years ago, and it looks very daunting. Uh, now, the problem is that many of those models are actually not about continental growth, but people didn't realize that for a long time. It turns out we can classify these models into four groups, mantle-based, crust-based, speculations or index estimates, and artifacts. The <laughs> mantle-based models are based on the notion that the ex extraction of continental crust leaves the mantle correspondingly uh, chemically depleted. So for example, if the mantle at 3 billion years ago was only half as depleted as the present day mantle, the mass of continental crust at that time would be only half of the present day mass. So mantle-based models are about net crust growth. That is, they tell us how much of continental crust we had in the past. On the other hand, crust-based models are just a distribution of formation ages of the crust we have now. That is the crust that has been preserved to the present day. This is a difference, it's, it's very important. The crust-based models don't, don't include the crust loss to the mantle by recycling, by like subduction and so on. So they serve as a lower bound on net crust growth. Mm -hmm. The third category is mostly speculation with some um, indirect estimates, and the fourth category is mere artifacts. Interestingly, uh, these models uh, by uh, Belosova et al. and the Dream et al. have been the most popular models in the last several years, So, and uh, this has been the source of uh, great confusion in the literature. It's really important to understand the difference between net continental growth, which is shown here in red, and something else. When we want to know how much of continental crust we had in the past, what we need to look at is net growth models. 
Now, even if you had lots of cardinal growth in the past, most of them just don't survive to the present day because of cluster recycling, like plate tectonic recycling, which is a loss of cluster materials to the mantle. So if we compile the formation ages of crustal rocks we have on the present day Earth, we get this uh, present day formation age distribution. And the difference between this net growth curve and present day formation age distribution reflects the time integrated effect of crustal recycling. And there's also processes called uh, crustal reworking, which refers to the processes within the crust that can reset rock ages. And the difference between formation age distribution and the surface age distribution reflects the effect of crustal reworking. Okay. At this point, you may want to know maybe uh, what about crustal growth models showing in Mohammed's tall crust? Man? And uh, this figure had four models listed here at the MIBER 2006. It's actually not about content of crust, but you can kind of think it as a like, kind of surface age distribution. Condi and Aster 2010 is a surface age distribution. Dewey Metal 2012 is just an artifact. San Metal is another artifact because they use the same method, but this is also regional model. So we can talk about continental growth based on this kind of study. So, so none of them is actually about net content of growth. But the fact is that uh, many geologists are still very confused about content of growth. So it will be very challenging for astrophysicists to get this right from the literature. In the last several years, I've been working on this content of growth problem. And these are the mantle-based model from my group uh, based on the neodymium mass of data, and my cross based model based on the title of zircon ages. They look very different, but that's okay because they are about different things. This mantle-based model tells you uh, net cross growth, and the cross based model is a present-day distribution of formation ages. Yes. In the literature, uh, this kind of model is often called an instantaneous growth model. And this one is called a gradual growth model, as if they represent different patterns of crustal growth, but they'll be very misleading. The difference between them simply reflects, as I said earlier, time integrated effect of crustal recycling. Now, what is exciting about these models is that uh, we can show, actually, these two models are consistent to each other because uh, this net growth model is built by geochemical box modeling, which comes with its own estimates on crustal recycling as shown here in orange. And uh, if you combine this crustal, uh, uh, this uh, net growth curve with this uh, crustal recycling, you can calculate the present day formation age distribution according to new DME ISO system which agrees quite well with the uh, zircon base estimate. This agreement is rather remarkable because uh, these two estimates are based on entirely different kinds of data sets and also on entirely different methods. This zigzag lines is based on the unmixing of detroit of zircon ages, and this blue shading is based on this box modeling of neodymium isotopes. Um, let me interrupt yes. you a little bit because uh, let me interrupt you. I, I'm a little oh. bit confused on this plot. Okay. Uh, because I, maybe there is something I don't understand, but what is at a given time the portion of continent on the Earth? Is, it a is there a difference between what you call crustal growth or, or is it what it is supposed to represent? Oh, okay, so this is uh how much of continental crust we had in the past, you can lead off from this red curve. So here, so if you, I mean, this is just one growth model, but according to, if you take this growth model, what this model tells you is that the amount of continental crust stays the same for the last about 4 billion years. Yes, yeah, so that's uh, or maybe because you, you tell that we misinterpreted some of the curve, but uh, it's a big difference from uh, most of the curves that were published. Is that right? 
You mean like uh, this one, right? Yes, this one. Yes. yes. Yeah. So, right. So, so my model is very close to like a so-called Armstrong model. This is a you know Armstrong published in 1981, and the most model is something like this. Okay. I mean, and then this is that. So, and the, but some of them like uh, these uh, bluish guys, they're class-based model. So they are basically formation age distribution. And the, the mantle-based model, so they, they have, so they still have this uh, kind of more gradual growth compared to uh, like a you know, recent neodymium isotope-based model. And this is uh, partly because of how those models are constructed. So they, um, because uh, the, you can have gradual growth with not much recycling, but you can also have instantaneous growth with lots of recycling. So there's a trade-off between them. And uh, and we are, this curve was constructed based on combining different kinds of, uh, there are two different neodymium isotope systems. By combining them, we can constrain both crustal recycling and the crustal growth. So that's, this, this curve is based on that type of constraint. Okay, thank you yeah. for the clarification. Okay. I let yeah. you keep going now. Okay. Okay. And this is a more recent effort on content of growth. And this time, uh, this one is a third category. There is an indirect approach because here we are using the evolution of atmospheric argon isotopes to quantify content of growth. This indirect inference is quite involved because uh, Atmospheric argon is sensitive to not just content of growth, but also a bunch of other processes like metastatic magnetism, which you need to account for. So as a result, our constraint on net crustal growth is rather broad, covering from instantaneous to gradual growth. But this net growth uh, reflects the uh, dynamic balance between crustal generation and crustal recycling. Uh, both of which seems to be very intense in the early Earth. So having lots of continental crust in the Earth's first 1 billion years or so is a real possibility. So that's more or less the state of art on the issue of content of growth. And now I'd like to turn to the history of ocean volume, which is as important as the evolution of continental crust if we want to understand the surface condition in the past. History of ocean volume is also a controversial issue, which different people saying different things. So I like to start with a, a few unquestionable basics. First, Earth has a so-called deep water cycle in which water is degassed from the mantle by magnetism and regassed into the mantle by subduction. If degassing and regassing are exactly balanced, the ocean volume doesn't change. But when people measure these things, uh, they, act, they usually find regassing is more important. So there is a positive net water flux from the mantle, I mean, from the surface to the mantle. But how much is very uncertain, uh, as shown here. To get uh, some feel for these numbers, uh, with the influx of 3 times 10 to 14 gram per year, it would take 4.5 billion years to drain the present day ocean. So anyway, the plate tectonics subduct water. And this means that we must have had a deeper ocean in the past. The ocean growth problem is, is a pretty complex problem in itself. And it would take an, an entire talk if I try to explain everything. So what I want to do here is to give you the big picture first and then focus on the part most relevant to early tidal evolution. This is a sketch for a likely evolution of ocean volume. And I am pretty sure about the last 2.5 billion years, uh, this part, because we have good geological constraints and the rest of it uh, is just a simple exploration of this trend. Until a few years ago, I thought it would keep going like this throughout Earth's history, but I had I had to change my mind because of a recent work on magma ocean solidification and Hadean geodynamics. Now I think uh, the early ocean started as very shallow and got quickly deepened by 
mandatory gassing. So I'd like to focus on explaining this early part in the next couple of slides. To think about the heading ion, it's really important to understand what might have happened with the magma motion because the solidification of a magma motion sets the stage for the early Earth evolution. The left panel is a cartoon showing how a magma motion cools down, uh, cools down and, 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 and then solidifies. And the right panel shows the uh, solubility of water and carbon dioxide in a magma as a function of pressure. And as you can see, uh, water um, is much more soluble than carbon dioxide. And this means that when you have a magma motion, most carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and most of water is in the magma motion. And when a magma motion solidifies, water in the magma motion is actually frozen in and you end up with a wet mantle and a very shallow ocean right after the solidification of the magma motion. And this wetness of early, very early mantle is probably important to sequester a large amount of carbon dioxide in the early atmosphere and make a habitable environment in the Hadean. Uh, this is a work we published in Nature last year. And here we are comparing two hypothetical worlds. Note that the time axis uh, is in the, here is the log scale and the left panel shows the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. This is a 100 birds and 10 birds and one bird. And the left panel shows the, uh, and the right panel is a corresponding surface temperature. Red dashed curve, this one, called the pyrite or homogeneous mantle, uh, is a case with a kind of mantle we have today. And in this case, carbon sequestration takes place more than 1 billion years. So surface temperature remains above 200 degrees Celsius for the first 1 billion years because of the greenhouse effect. And this is inconsistent with the geological record on uh, PCO2. But if we had a wet chemical heterogeneous mantle, we, we can have a very rapid plate tectonics, which can sequester uh, carbon dioxide 10 times faster. And with this rapid plate tectonics, the mantle can efficiently degas water to surface, and it's possible to have a deep ocean by the end of the Hadean. So if we combine the likely history of ocean volume and the likely history of continental growth, it may look like this. In the early Hadean, we have a shallow ocean and not much of continental crust, but the ocean volume keeps growing. And at the same time, continents start to emerge. Because of competing growth of ocean and continents, we might have had the large amount of exposed landmass, but by the late Hadean or the early Archean, the ocean probably becomes deep enough to inundate most of continents. Uh, deep ocean means a dry mantle, and the wet, uh, dry, uh, dry mantle is much more viscous than the wet mantle. So the temple plate tectonics slows down, which helps to bring back water from the surface to the mantle by subduction. So the history of ocean volume is likely to be non-monotonic. And the first 1 million years of Earth's history probably witnessed a dramatic change in the ocean continent configuration. And this is a, a big problem for ocean tides, which are, as I noted earlier, which are very sensitive to the details of ocean content configuration, as indicated by this work of Motoyama and others. So we may be able to make progress refining, uh, by defining our understanding of ocean growth and content of growth, but it would take time. So at the moment, it may still be premature to pass through this backward in approach if we want to discuss a very early Earth situation. So this leaves us the forward in time approach um, as the only option. And this approach is actually not so bad as it may seem. The formation of the moon from proto-lunar disks, disk after the giant impact has, has to happen outside the Russia limit, which is about uh, three Earth radii as indicated by this vertical line here. And according to the theoretical studies, moon likely formed somewhere between three and five Earth radii. And, uh, and uh, there is one previous study which adapted this forward in time approach. And this is the one by Kevin Zandi and others as shown here. A few different things are plotted in this figures I like to walk you through. Note that the 
uh, time axis is again in log scale. So this is uh, 1 million years and 10 million years, 100 million years, and so on. And shown in blue uh, is a lunar distance. And in their model, moon started at 3.5 Earth radii somewhere around here. And for the first 2 million years, uh, it moves rather slowly, reaching to 10 Earth radii. And then it moves away very quickly and gets to the 40 Earth radii in the next several million years. And then a recession slows down and the moon doesn't move much. This red line is a tidal, uh, is a corresponding tidal Q evolution. Lower Q means a greater tidal dispersion. And, this, uh, and then these green lines indicate the periods of uh, magma ocean solidification. So this is a liquidus, is when the magma ocean starts to solidify, and the solidus is when it completely solidifies. To understand this peculiar pattern of lunar recession and this tidal Q evolution during this uh, magma ocean solidification, we need to understand two things. The first is the rheological transition. This is a schematic illustration of for how viscosity changes with the solidifying magma ocean. Left is hot, the temperature is high, and the right is cold, and this phi and this is temperature, and this is a phi is a melt fraction. So one is a entirely molten, zero is a completely frozen. And as you can see, uh, viscosity, the vertical axis is a viscosity, and the viscosity goes up by many orders of magnitude when the melt fraction approaches the so-called critical fraction, which is usually around 0.4. So above this critical fraction, magma behaves as a uh, above this critical fraction. Magma behaves as a liquid, and below this critical fraction, it behaves basically as a solid. This behavior is what we call the rheological transition. The second thing is uh, magma ocean heat flow scaling, which looks like this. And, uh, and, and, like as, and like any other thermal convection, heat flow depends on the Rayleigh number, which in turn depends on viscosity, this new here. So when viscosity shoots up, by many others of magnitude at this critical melt fraction, magma ocean heat flow plunges drastically as the magma ocean cannot maintain its surface, a high surface temperature anymore. So magma ocean basically stops working at that point. So this plot shows the thermal evolution of Earth corresponding to the tidal evolution shown previously. Uh, this uh, purple and blue Lines show the internal. This is the internal. Purple is the internal, and the uh, blue is the surface temperatures. And they go down together until the rheological transition. So there's somewhere between liquidus and solidus. And then uh, the after rheological transition, surface temperature plunges like this. When this happens, okay. When this happens, tidal Q goes down substantially, mean, uh, meaning that the significant tidal dispersion. And this tidal heating helps slow down the cooling of the magma ocean. And this results in a few million years of significant tidal dissipation and the moon receives to as much as 40 hours a day. Okay, so do you see the geological transition playing two different roles here? So it gives rise to great amount of tidal dissipation because you know, the mushy state is the most efficient in terms of tidal dissipation. And, uh, and also reduces the surface heat flow, okay? And, and it helps to, which helps to keep the tidal heating within the solidifying magma motion. Now, uh, the only problem with this model, uh, which is a big problem actually, is that the magma motion shouldn't solidify like this. Again, this is a cartoon showing how a magma motion solidifies and this, uh, uh, so this, this is a cut I'm talking about. This dotted line is a liquid ass, and this solid line is a solid ass, and this dashed line is a uh, melt fraction for, uh, you know, the temperature for critical uh, melt fraction, like where you should have rheological transition, okay? Um, so liquid ass and solid ass, and this is a, this a bold line is a, is, is a mantle area, but so, 
So because liquid ice and solid ice are steeper than the adiabat, so when a magma ocean cools down, its adiabat crosses the liquid ice at the bottom, meaning that the magma ocean solidifies from the bottom, as illustrated by this cartoon. And, and then, now this cartoon is taken from Soramato's uh, 2015 review article, but this behavior of magma ocean solidification has long been known, and this is since the early 1990s. Shown to the right is my students' effort to better quantify uh, those melting curves and, and those amount of area, but by compiling all of experimental constraints on high pressure mantle melting in a thermodynamically consistent manner. Uh, this red line is adiabat for potential temperature of 14, 4,500K, and this orange one is for 4,000K and so on. So when magma ocean starts solidify some, uh, so magma ocean starts solidify somewhere between uh, those two temperatures. And this dotted line uh, is represents the rheological transition and crossing of this transition takes place with a potential temperature of about 3000 K. So magma ocean starts to experience a rheological transition much earlier when the surface experiences a rheological transition for which we have to wait until the potential temperature becomes about 1500 K. Now, if you think about how magma ocean ends and what's going to happen afterwards, it probably goes like this. This cartoon shows the uh, very final phase of magma ocean solidification, in which you have just a little bit of a uh, melt layer, which hasn't experienced the rheological transition. So this idea about the above the rheological transition. And when the surface reaches the rheological transition, this is the end of vigorous magma convection. And the whole thing just stops. And we have a leftover melt phase, which contains lots of water. And because of its buoyancy, this melt phase percolates up upwards. And the gassing associated with this melt percolation creates the early ocean, which is not so deep, probably much less than one kilometer deep. And if we wait even further, we eventually transition to subsolidus mantle convection, which can degas the water in the mantle to the surface, gradually, gradually deepening the ocean. Now we can model this whole process starting from uh, fully molten magma ocean to the beginning of subsolidus mantle convection in a framework of thermal evolution. Uh, basically, we solve this energy balance equation, which shows the mantle temperature, uh, this mantle potential temperature T sub P, uh, changes with time depending on the balance uh, of heat sources, including tidal dispersion, uh, radiogenic heating, core heat flux and heat loss from the surface. Uh, most important term for this talk is, of course, this tidal dispersion term. And the, in case you're super curious about the details of how we actually calculate those things, we solve this equation to get the spheroidal deformation of Earth by a tight raising potential. Uh, this ULM, VLM, here are radial or tangential displacement. And from them, we can calculate complex strain and complex stress, and finally viscous dissipation, uh, viscous dissipation uh, by the Earth tide by evaluating this volume integral uh, covering the whole mantle. This calculation itself is a fairly standard procedure. Like many people uh, do this, but what matters most is how to prepare a viscosity structure by properly accounting for mantle liquid as solid as and and then, and then the mantle idea about. So if we visualize tidal dissipation as a function of mantle temperature, this vertical axis, and the lunar distance, this horizontal axis, it looks like this. This reddish part uh, is about 10 to the 19th Pascal, and then 19, 10 to the 19th Watt, uh, which is huge. And it goes down by a few orders of magnitude as uh, the moon moves away from Earth. Tidal dissipation is most significant when the mantle potential temperature is around uh, 2,500 to 3,000, where a large fraction of the magma ocean is near the rheological transition. So this makes sense. And this is a representative result from some evolution modeling. The left panel shows the mantle potential temperature in red and uh, a surface temperature in blue. We start with a potential temperature of 
4500K to put the whole mantle about the liquid gas. And uh, magma motion cools down with a time scale of uh, 10 to the fourth to 10 to the five fifth years. And this sudden uh, drop in surface temperature marks the end of the magma motion phase. The right panel shows the various heat fluxes. The orange line uh, for the surface heat flux from the magma motion and the red line uh, for tidal dispersion. As you can see, tidal heating uh, even though it's significant, uh, tidal heating in a solidified magma motion is always much, much lower than the surface heat flux. So tidal dispersion doesn't really help to slow down the solidification of a magma motion. And this is a critical difference from the previous work of Zandi at our 2015. And this is a corresponding evolution of lunar distance. Uh, during the magma motion phase, uh, the session of the moon is fairly limited, uh, and the moon moves by only a few Earth radii. After the end of magma motion, water ocean appears, and to guide our speculation, uh, here I have drawn four hypothetical cases with defined values of Q over lab number, K2. If Q over K2 is, for example, 100, um, uh, we go like this, and if we want to merge with uh, Muhammad's model, uh, this, this right blue here, Q over K should be somewhere between 100 and 1,000, which is not an unreasonable value. Obviously, this new result is very different from, from Zandi's model, which is shown by this orange here. And, uh, and this is, uh, so, you know, so if you take this Zandi's model, then it's kind of hard to, um, uh, you know, reconcile, for example, uh, with, uh, Mohammed, Mohammed's model. Anyway, so this is almost entirely due to how magma motion solidification is modeled. Left panel is how we model it, and the right panel is how Zandi and others did it in their 2015 paper. In their model, there's no pressure dependence of liquid ice and solid ice. So liquid ice is here, so it's the same as surface, uh, you know, value as uh, surface. And the entire mantle takes one temperature. And it's a, you know, there's a reason why they did it because uh, uh, they wanted to use a simplified approach because they calculated tidal dissipation using a formula valid only for homogeneous material properties. So the entire matter has to take one temperature and just one viscosity. But as you can probably tell, uh, this is probably too much of an approximation. And this difference in modeling strategy results in this very big difference in uh, uh, predicted lunar decision. Okay, Zanli's original uh, isothermal magma motion model uh, starts to crystallize only after um, after one million years, and because and uh, because the liquid temperature is very low, and as it cools down, the entire mantle experiences the entire mantle, okay, not just a part of mantle, entire mantle experiences the rheological transition at the same time, dissipating lots of energy and moon recedes at the substantial rate. And in the model, uh, there's no ocean. So this whole evolution is solely due to magma ocean solidification. But what should actually happen instead is this, uh, it's just this much. So uh, in terms of time scale of solidification, we see uh, two orders of magnitude difference. And in terms of a lunar recession, about one or that's magnitude difference. And this limited lunar recession during magma motion solidification is a, a fairly robust result, which is not very sensitive to uh, how we set up models. The reference model I just show uh, is shown here in red, uh, this one. And if the initial distance is uh, five, hours, five hours radii, you get um, initial distance is, uh, yeah, yeah, five hours radii, you get only three hours radii recession at the end of solidification. And even if you start at 3.5 hours radii, you end up with, uh, you, you end up with a similar uh, location because a shorter lunar distance gives greater tidal dissipation. So in general, greater recession requires weaker mantle rheology or higher 
melt viscosity. But even if we make the mantle as soft as possible within these uncertainties and using the uh, highest possible melt viscosity, the moon can get to only about 11 Earth radii at the end of solidification. And this should be seen as a highly unlikely end member situation because it's really difficult to justify the high, this high melt viscosity of a 10 pascal second, which is not appropriate for the uh, you know, periodotitic melt. And this is another set of sensitivity tests in which I change the critical melt fraction for the rheological transition. So 0.4 is a reference case. And if you change this 0.3 or 0.6, uh, you know, as you can see, I, it doesn't change the result much. So moving on to the lunar inclination problem, as I noted earlier, there are multiple hypotheses and we may classify them into two categories, early origin, and late origin. The lunar inclination can be achieved very early by gravitational interaction with, with the remnant protolunar disk material, but a bit later by evection resonance at around five Earth radii followed by evection resonance. Or it can also be achieved over a much longer time scale, uh, like 100 million years, by collision-less excitation by leftover planetesimals. But there's one big problem for this RE origin about one big problem for this RE origin hypothesis. Uh, the lunar inclination achieved RE can be erased by the so-called inclination damping if the lunar magma ocean existed when the lunar distance was about uh, 20 to 30 hours radii. Yeah. This was first pointed out by Cheng and Nemo. And these are figures from the paper. And the horizontal axis is a lunar distance, and uh, this is time. And so these blue lines correspond to uh, slower lunar distance scenarios than this red one. And the top panel shows the corresponding lunar inclinations. So if the moon is receding as fast as this red line, you like to have the uh, lunar magma motion and the primordial inclination is reduced substantially like this when you know lunar distance uh, approaches to take 20 some earth radii but if the moon is receding slowly enough you can keep a large fraction of the primordial inclination so with the previous forward in time model forward in time lunar recession model by Zandi et al it's almost impossible to preserve uh, primordial lunar inclination, but that may, that may not be the case with the new recession model. And at the same time, the collision-less uh, excitation mechanism may become less efficient because it, its efficiency is proportional to the cross-sectional area of Earth's moon system, but it's still relevant. So all of those proposed mechanisms for the lunar inclination may have contributed some to the present day inclination. And I also mentioned that, that there is a totally different way of explaining the lunar inclination, starting with the high obliquity, high angular momentum Earth proposed by Chuck and Stewart. And this is their latest modeling result. Um, this is a, a lunar, where is it? Lunar, yeah, this is a lunar distance here. And this is eccentricity, this is inclination, and this is obliquity. And that, uh, you know, they, they all show as a function of time from, you know, this is, uh, you know, 100 million years. And it, it looks uh, kind of wild and complicated. And that, but it, at the moment, it's difficult to comment on this model because this evolution model has a time span of 100 million years. So ocean tides dominate the tidal evolution of Earth's moon system. And as I noted earlier, um, modeling of ocean tides is very tricky, especially during the early years. And yet, in this kind of orbital dynamic studies, it's fairly common to employ a very simple assumption about tidal dispersion. Like, for example, this, uh, this result uh, assumed the uh, Q tidal dispersion over love number for both Earth and Moon uh, is constant at the uh, uh, 100 for the for, for, for the entire evolution. So robustness of this type of model 
uh, to the details of earth and lunar tides is yet to be seen. Okay, so to wrap up, here's a conclusion. Uh, history of continental growth and ocean volume is likely to have been most dramatic during the early Earth, presenting a considerable challenge to the backward integration approach to the tidal evolution of the Earth's moon system. A proper modeling of tidal dissipation within Earth's magma ocean can provide a tight constraint on early lunar dissipation. And the new model of lunar dissipation facilitates the resolution of the lunar inclination problem by allowing both early and late excitation mechanisms. And finally, more detailed analysis of lunar orbital evolution requires a careful con consideration of ocean tides and the growth of ocean and continents in the Hadean. And thank you for your attention. Thank you a lot, uh, June, uh, for, for this very stimulating talk and uh, which, uh, which raised many questions. Um, so we are now uh, open for discussion and um, waiting. So raise your hand, raise the little hand to if you have some question and uh, letting people find the time to raise their hand. I have already some remarks. Um, it's about the, um, the point you mentioned for the, the geological observation of the Earth's moon distance in the, uh, the, the, the oldest one you put on your, on your plot. Maybe you can go back yeah. because you... Um, maybe you can go on one of oh, yeah. the previous plots. It depends. Yeah, you have it. No, no, show it on, on the... Yeah, because you... Yes, here. Yeah, this one. Yeah, because you put the bounded iron point here. I don't know from which reference you have that, but all the recent bounded iron point are right on the Faratetal curve. They are not there. So, okay, uh, maybe so I need to uh, look into this, but uh, because I, yeah, I took from this, maybe review paper from 2009, so maybe that's already outdated. I suppose. And, uh, because there is uh, both the both the recent work of uh, Margaret and who is here and uh, the work of Linda they put all this bonded iron formation a height on the, or very close to the Faratetal curve so i think of course you show i understand well in in in, in your analysis and if in your latest plot that uh, the, the circumstances at the very early stage of the of the Earth are very complex because you have uh, this evolution of the Q that means the tidal uh, dissipation factor coming from the from the evolution of the of the mantle of the magma of the magma Earth and. Uh, so I understand that, and that, that uh, a proper scenario should take uh, this into account for the early stage. But if you look to, to your curve, uh, now go back to, to one of your latest curve for extrapolation. Yes, yeah, this curve. You see that, uh, in fact, if you believe, and which I think it's relatively uh, uh, very, um, there, there seems to be very solid. If you believe the, that the point for the bounded iron formation, the geological evidence is right on the curve we 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 end up with the the Faradetal curve, then you see that your your Q they cannot be your Q of a K two evolution will not match them. Uh, and uh, but you have also to take into account the ocean resonance to to do that. You cannot go with a constant Q over K uh, like like what you have here. So so I think that uh, um, I think that uh, I I don't have I'm not afraid of your of this plot. I think uh, that. Oh no, I'm not saying you know this uh, this constant Q is. Is not. I'm not saying it should evolve around any of those curves. It's just to show the, you know, the 
what yes, the, some limits. The possible range of yeah That's possible right. range of tidal evolution because it's really hard to go below i mean probably it's hard to go below 10 for example so it should be somewhere between you know of course because uh, resonance no, no, and so on so you, you can we can fluctuate. go be, we can go below 10 because uh, that's right. the present that's the present value we are the 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 value is around 10 and uh, yep. but if you go to higher value of the resonance we well inside the oceanic resonance you go below these values so Pardon, we, you, if you have ocean resonance, you go below 10 for Q. And you, increase, oh, okay. you increase the dissipation with respect to what is now. We are not, yeah, we are, yeah sure, sure, but uh, we are not at a maximum right now. We are not at a maximum of tidal dissipation. We are close to a maximum, but not at the maximum. Right. So Q over K, oh, I mean, of course, but I think, yeah, that's fine. I mean, um just my point I'm, is I'm that this, just, this I'm is just that, saying that there is still a lot of possibility and uh, and this is something yes, yes. yeah this is something we will of course investigate because we, we will be we 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 will be looking to the early stage and uh, and that's really a challenge from what you are showing here i understand that it's really some challenging work and uh, that we need to put together all uh, right lot right. of yeah, Many of that, them which are very uncertain, but uh, but I think the most uh, interesting thing is the one of the interesting thing is the evolution of the of the magma Earth. Right. Yes. So my point here, you know, this result, this new result, open up, you know, points out there's a this huge. I mean, I mean, it's not that long, you know, but if, like 100 million years or so of a kind of a space to explore. Because if you take this previous model, because magma motion solidifies, it take, solidification takes place like 100 million years. Okay, so you, and then you have ocean. Okay, so it, it's not, there's not much you can do because you are already here when you solidify magma motion. So, you know, you need to connect this to whatever backup in, you know, actually this is kind of most consistent with Tyro or Daha stuff. But, um, but my point is, because this model is not based on a proper uh, understanding of magma motion solidification. So we should be ending here. So how, you know, we need to think about how to go from here to, uh, you know, yeah, that's right. Their understanding. So yes, yes, yeah. Okay. Any other question? Linda, you had a question. I just wanted to thank you so much for the talk, and I put some things in the chat, but I I have to leave. I have another call. So thank you very, very much. Actually, could, could you would you mind sending me those uh, papers for those data points? Yes. Yeah. So there's yeah. the new Moody's group result for 3.2 billion years ago. And someday, maybe I'll talk to you about this, uh, okay. a tidalite in the Ishua formation. So, okay. uh, yeah, so that might seven. help a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank the, you. Yeah. We, the, um, the Moody group gets give some results at 3.2. And yeah. there are, of course, there is a lot of still a lot of uncertainty there, but they are on the on the curve. On the, on the curve. On the, curve. They are very close to the uh, to the Farad curve. Yeah. And uh, at the point where there is a step down, you see, at uh, mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. one billion year in your one. Because you're, it's 3.2 billion years. It's so thank you again so much. I have to go. Thank you. Okay. Bye, Linda. Nice to have you here. Hey. Uh, not really. I learned uh, a lot of things, <laughs> I would say, because it's not my uh, really my uh, my expertise here. Uh, okay. So thank you for your talk. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Thank you. And Julien, Julien Monteux, do you have a some reaction? 
I just tried to activate my my mic. Uh, thank you, June, for uh, this presentation. It was very interesting. Uh, would you have any comment on the, the possible interactions between the the moon and the magma chain in terms of uh, of mixing during the 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 moon is moving uh, away from from the earth yeah. oh you mean like a chemical equilibrium between those two things yeah, yeah. I, 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 how can the interaction as the moon is moving away from the from the earth and as there is still a, a magma motion cooling uh is there any chance right. that uh we can envision uh, some pattern in terms of uh mixing uh, stratigraphy or differentiation within the magma ocean or even some crystallization processes or whatever oh okay okay yeah sure sure okay you're talking about that okay so like a, for example how when ma our magma motion cools down uh what kind of uh like uh chemical differentiation could take place yeah what your, yeah so right so my the the model i showed uh assume the more or less homogeneous um kind of crystallization so you don't have any compositional differentiation across the mantle depth but if you're familiar with uh our work we also you know in a different papers you know previous paper we discussed the that's actually not a very likely case we should have a chemical differentiation and so on. And, but for this one, for this part, title dissipation work, the chemical differentiation is less important um, than, you know, it's, it's influence on the other aspect of like sub solid mantle convection, because if you have chemical differentiation stuff, then uh, you tend to reduce the special extent of uh, uh, create like you know mushy region where you have an optimal the most like highest tidal dispersion so assuming the homogeneous mantle gives you the greatest amount of tidal dispersion meaning that the uh like a largest possible lunar dissection so because my work you know the, the major difference from uh previous work like Zandi and others is that compared to their model my lunar dissection model, uh, you know, move just doesn't move much. So that means that tidal dissipation is much much lower than previous estimate. So, so that's so this uh, assumption of homogeneous, you know, chemical homogeneous mantle works well for uh, this study because uh, I'm already maximizing the amount of tidal dissipation you can have in the solidifying magma motion. So of course, you know, I expect. Uh, you know, like solidifying magma motions should chemically differentiate, and this should give rise to some interesting Hadean geodynamics. But uh, for this particular, you know, lunar decision stuff, it's uh, it's less important. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, Anastasia, you have a <clears throat> you have a question. You have a. I have a question now <clears throat> on the uh, continental crust growth. I understand there are some effect of tidal. Uh, so, but uh, now we, uh, well, it's, it's very interesting, but uh, what we uh, show uh, by recent experiments on the hydrated uh, serpentinite uh, um, melting, we have got about 40% of phasic crust during Hadean. <laughs> So it's not published, it's a uh, Goldschmidt abstract will be presented in on the session of Alex Sobolev and uh, mm -hmm. but it's just new. Uh, the question is uh, uh, how this phasic crust does, not, uh, this the phasic crust actually does not survive, but how you think uh, it's possible by recycling in the mantle uh, by uh, subduction already in, during Haden, what do you think about the survival of this uh, crust, uh, which could be abundant and vol voluminous in Haden? Yeah, so what you're suggesting, so you have, so your recent work suggests you can have like 40% of the present day 
you know, in, in terms of like a mass, like you have, you can have 40% or so of basic class in the Hadean. Is that what you thought? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, I think, what I also think, you know, you have, you, you can have that much of continental class easily in the Hadean. So um, uh, I don't have any problem with this estimate, but is that your question is about how do you recycle those? Yeah, how, how this crust does not preserve on, on the earth. How right, you, right. Uh, yeah, what's your so, mechanism? Okay, so um, um, because crust recycling um, is, uh, let's see, so when when you don't have a you know strong continental lithosphere beneath continental crust, it's really easy to I mean I, I expect it's really easy to deform continental crust and make it thin. So it's you know if you have a very thick continental crust, I sub, I think it's it's really difficult to subduct it. But if you don't have a you know strong foundation like we have for you know for the modern Earth, like you know like a very viscous uh, continental lithospheric kill, it will be easy to um, you know, stretch continental crust by convection current. So it helps them to get recycled by subduction. So yeah, so that's that's my speculation. Okay, so you you suggest subduction in Hadean, right? Yes, yes, yeah. yeah in okay. my in my thinking, like uh, we have pre-tectonics soon after the solidification of magma motion. Okay. So yeah. thank you. Any any other comment or question? Uh, uh, if yes. I have... Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Uh, Jung, thank you a lot for a very enlightening enlightening uh, talk. I personally learned a lot. Um, I have many questions, but I think we'll we'll have a more exchange after the talk because maybe I will write you more. But uh, just a few questions on what you uh, showed. So uh, I learned a lot about magma solidification, crustal growth. Obviously, there's a confusion in the literature about that, as you showed, and as I as we also discussed in the paper, because that's why we chose effective uh, configuration rather than uh, a specific configurations that go along any of these curves, because. They're basically irreconcilable and they are uh, based maybe on different interpretations. But so in your model of crustal growth, you show this very fast uh, net growth of the uh, of the crust, but then you showed the evolution of ocean volume. And I just want to make sure that I understood correctly that uh, 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 you might have a very fast also oceanic volume uh, uh, evolution that even with a very fast continental crust evolution, the presence of any continents could be subaqueous. Is that correct? Sub. Hmm? So you mean subaqueous? So they would be yeah, in the in one of your plot. You have yeah. you have the water that goes above the continent. So you had a big continental crust goes, right, but right. the okay, water so goes faster. Have, uh... And uh, you you we we want to know what is a part of the continent that is emerged. Yeah, because that that would affect uh, uh, the yeah. So this kind of stuff. Yes, um, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. So that's a delicate problem. You know, this is something I need to work. You know, keep working on this. But this is just a cartoon. So I'm showing um, one possibility. So it's possible. Okay, it's possible to have some. This is actually go above sea level. So you have exposed land mass here. So it's possible to have large amount of exposed land mass in mid Hegdian, but this is only possible. You know, if it ha ever happened in the areas, it's only possible in the mid Hegdian. But, but this may not happen, you know, because um, it, it, ocean growth may win over the continental growth. So maybe content may always be submarine. So that's also a possibility. So yeah. uh, to, to, to talk about this, you know, to nail, this problem down, uh, I, I need to do more, you know, thinking and modeling and so on. Yeah. So, okay. but the, uh, just take, you know, take this as a, you know, just a one possibility, but you can also have water world, like, uh, you know, the only exposed land would be just oceanic islands. Okay. 
Yeah, so that's also another in the end member for three. Probable? Can you comment on the probability of that, or it's just like? Uh... Uh, it, um, at this moment, it you I cannot quantify. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it uh, it that uh, you know I need to work on both content of growth problem. You know we have some new avenues to explore, and yeah. also this ocean this early ocean growth is that we just realized this possibility very recently. So which also need to be quantified. Yeah. Okay. So can you? I mean, because this is not my field, and so I would uh, really benefit from your comment on that. So are you aware of the work of? Um, um, uh, Fisher and Donget, uh, the experimental. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, I, I review the paper, so I, I'm okay. very happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so can you comment on uh, whether they are uh, consistent with your uh, models? Because they also predict uh, some mot mantle water capacity that would uh, suggest. Uh, yeah, so it, uh, it's okay. So their result, okay, first of all, um, when it comes to how much water you can store in the lower mantle, it has a huge uncertainty. Okay, so I think what's what's most certain, like robust aspect, is a uh, um, because of this uh, temperature dependency of water solubility in mantle minerals. If mantle is hotter in the past, you cannot, um, you know, it, mantle cannot have lots of water in it, right? So you can use their results to reject the notion of uh, like a total, like a, you know, combined water budget of Earth, like combining water in the mantle and water in the ocean, like 10 ocean, because some people say, you know, uh, we can have like a 10 ocean worth of water in the mantle, but that's probably not very unlikely, okay? Because, but uh, but for this, you know, we are talking about like a more reasonable estimate for the total water budget for ocean mantle combined is like a two ocean. Mm -hmm. But this much, you, you can easily store like a, you know, two ocean worth of water in the entire month, even when mantle is hot. So, yeah, so, you know, within the existing uncertainty of uh, water solubility in mantle minerals, uh, you know, it's their study is is just con yeah, it's perfectly consistent with this type of ocean language. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks, Jacques. Do I, do, do I still have a minute for another? Session? Yeah, sure. So, um, so if you go to 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 the final figure, which is the evolution figure with time uh, with all the models on it, um, so you did not explain a lot on the how. So okay, so I understand the yeah. So I had very similar when I read the paper of Zanli. I had very similar points that you raised about. So but now I understood more about solidification. But I I shared shared a lot of points that you mentioned now. So I'm happy to hear that. Uh, but so you also have this uh, forward curve, and I would expect just just something that uh, bugs me because if you go back into this much time. I would expect that tides within the moon would be uh, uh, might be dominant because at that very early stage with the moon that this close uh, tides within the moon might be dominant and they have the the opposite effect of uh, uh, on the uh, evolution of the earth moon distance so tides lunar tides yes, yes that's right yeah right. Tend, yeah to bring the so, moon so, so yeah yeah that so, also yeah works because right because I think I yeah, when I was yeah, at, uh, when I was responding to Julian, because right, the point of my work is that moon just doesn't move much, right? Yeah. So if you take into account this, uh, you know, lunar ties influence on this, uh, you know, semi-major axis, then it's actually, you know, should be lo even lower than this. And so yeah. I'm trying to press some bound on the, how much moon can recede. So, yeah. so then, you know, of course, I'm pretty, you know, basically fine with, you know, you know, like things can go lower because I'm trying to delineate the maximum. Wow. Yeah, but but that's my question. So if things can go lower to to maintain your self consistency, that would also affect temperature, and then you would not grow into this dissipative model. That and then how how do you ex escape this regime? I mean, do you know what I'm saying? Oh no no you can no you, you can because the tidal dissipation I, I think I showed you. Um, okay. Tidal dissipation is like this is surface heat flux. Okay, so yeah. like a 
because uh, this, this is very important because uh, why this happened is that uh, so it, okay, maybe which one I should go? Maybe I should go this way. Yeah, so when, for example, uh, mantle potential temperature is 3000 K you have in this green line, okay? So you are, you know, this part of the mantle is close to the biological transition. So it dissipates lots of heat, okay? So that's that's where that's this corresponds to this part, right? Yeah. So, but when you your mantle is more efficient in terms of tidal dissipation, surface temperature is still very high, like this. So yeah. because this part is entirely molten, so I have a very low viscosity, so fully convecting, very vigorously convecting. So because of this, you have a you know this surface heat flux is like. Uh, like three orders of magnitude, actually this one. So it's like a still like a one or two orders of magnitude is greater. So to slow down cooling, this tidal dissipation has to be even, you know, go higher, but it just, you just cannot have, you know, even if you keep moving closer, you, you always have okay. high sub heat flow, so it keeps cooling down. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I see that, that's, uh, okay. Thank you for the answer because yeah, so now I see because I, I just thought if you if you keep it closer, but then you need to escape this regime, you know, because I, I think also you do not allow for so one comment, uh, if I may, just not a question. You commented on the inclination problem and the evaction scenario. It is true that evaction, um, I mean, the scenario could have, I mean, what you're saying as post evaction, the inclination damping. Uh, uh, would then damp the inclination and then, you, uh, but that does not say anything about the, whether the evaction happened because it will happen. You know what I'm saying? The the outcome of the evolution is not, uh, uh, does not say anything about whether the evaction resonance happened or not, because it, it only has to do whether with the evolution of the upcycle, the orbital period of the earth and the upcycle motion of the moon. So, so it did happen yeah. and uh, uh, it excited the inclination Damping can happen afterwards, but that doesn't say about uh, uh, anything about whether the uh, evaction happened or not. But so here, here also in your models, you do not consider such dynamical scenarios, right? Right, right. right. Yeah. So okay. that's actually, so this is something because, because I... Um, also would bring the moon closer because the evolution right. of the yes. Earth moon distance would also decrease. Yeah, right. So the plan is that, uh, so we have a proposal submitted with, you know, I'm, I'm involved in like a Southwest Research Institute. That's a proposal on the lunar evolution. So I'm going to work with Robin Kanup and uh, and you know Haruka Lufu. So I work on this dissipation stuff, and they work on orbital dynamics, and we we try to combine okay. those two things. You know, okay. you know, in a self consistent manner. Yes, okay. I'm looking forward to this collaboration. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's it for now for me. Uh, um, if I may, then uh, leaving on the same on this slide, um, what is the uh, what is the solidity? What is robust in which curve are robust in this slide? Oh, uh, which curve is robust? What, what, what is the robust result there? What, what is, uh, what is uh, the possibility of variation? What, what are the robust results in this? Oh, okay, so for example, okay, so um, this red curve. Well, this orange curve, you know, this the like, what is shown in a solid line, not dash line, is what I think uh, most likely case. And as I told you, so this dash line is when melt viscosity is uh, 10 pascal second. And this is very, you know, so it may not sound as very high for you, but uh, because basalt, if you melt, basaltic rock and it has a viscosity of 10 pascal second. But if you melt periodotite, like whole like mantle like rock, then viscosity is like 0.1 pascal second, or actually even lower at, at high temperature. So so this is like a very, very viscous melt. And this is very, you know, most likely melt viscosity. So it kind of go like go down like this. So to answer your question, so yes, 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 yes. For, yes yeah, this part is a Yes. So it's, uh, I think, because after magma ocean solidified, we have surface ocean, then, you know, everything becomes very uncertain. But 
as long as we are dealing with Mag motion, things are relatively simple. So um, I and the, okay, and the important fact is, you know, just as I explained to Mohammed, the very important point in my study is there's a uh, large difference between you know, surface heat flux is always much higher than tidal dissipation, and this and because of this, tidal dissipation doesn't stop solidification of magma motion. So magma motion keeps cooling down while tidal dissipation is taking place. And this uh, is no. very robust. Um, can, I, can I comment or ask a question on that? Sure. Yeah. Uh, just a very uh, naive question because I've never dealt with magma ocean. How do you compute dissipation from uh, magma ocean? Like this one. So you... So you consider, considering the solid case, the solid limit, I mean. This oh is yeah, a, so we have a so we, 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 melt fraction is a melt fraction is greater than critical, it's liquid. So we have a liquid layer, you know, solid layer. So so okay. yeah, this equation for solid one. So yeah. for liquid, uh, we, we don't have any dissipation. And actually, but when what, you have a that liquid, was exactly my question. Why are you saying you don't have any dissipation in the liquid? Yeah, yeah. So when you have a solid, when you have a total liquid, then we impose like a uh, like a maximum dissipation. So I think in this case, tidal Q is set to 10 to the fourth, and this is what people, many people do. So if, you know, you can, you can have a dissipation from turbulence and based on observation of Jupiter and this gas giant or stellar uh, stuff, um, even if you have an entire liquid, you can have as much as 10 to the fourth. Well, you know, this is like, there's a range, like 10 to the fourth to 10 to the sixth, and I'm taking the kind of a maximum tidal dissipation for the entire uh, liquid case. So that's this bar corresponds. So, so this is where, you know, before um, you enter the logical transition, and after you enter the logical transition, it goes down to like below 100. Okay. This is a log 10, right? So, and then, and then, so, so tidal Q, so, this is entirely molten magma motion, and then this is corresponding tidal dissipation, and this goes up, but it, you know, it's still much lower than the surface heat flux. So thanks again, June. That was that was really a great talk, and uh, I, I'm sure we learn a lot, and this will be extremely useful for for the understanding of the early stage of the of, of the Earth. Thank and, you. Uh, Thank it you. will be very challenging as well. So I'm sure we'll be interacting again in the right, right. Yeah, I hope so. Thank you very much for invitation. Okay. So goodbye to everybody. And uh, I can tell you that the next talk in the Astrogeo seminar will be in a totally different uh, subject because we'll go back to climate. And uh, it will be given by, uh, by Didier Payard. On the uh, so this is to go from the insulation to the to the climate. So it will be on climate models, uh, on uh, and it will be on the uh, on the on March thirty. Okay. So goodbye again to everybody and thanks again, June. That was a great, really, really okay. nice talk. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.